um, change his meeting to today um, because uh, Mr. Uh, Brady came, Mr. Senator Brady came. And so he has been wonderful in searching out and looking for information that may be of interest to Huntsville and Walker County on um, what's going to be happening with uh, roads around here. So, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me here. Let me take the time. I initially was going to talk about um, this I-14 project only. Um, had a little bit kind of a longer presentation, but I had a couple people ask me what I knew about the Texas bullet train. So knowing I was pushing it back a month or so, I, I did some research on that. So now I have two little presentations that, that we'll go about. Um, I, I always preface this conversation by I, I'm not in, I don't endorse this or advocate for it or I'm against it. Just kind of delivering some information and, and the folks you can kind of make your mind up or come up with your own questions so a lot of us know some don't but texas has a really big <coughs> military footprint the nice three bases in general fort bliss fort Boone, and fort polk they transfer stuff back and forth to stop across the state quite a bit and it's always been kind of a dream to have this highway that connects all of them you may have heard the term um, forts to ports Basically, they're looking for a way to get from Fort Bliss to Fort Hood to Fort Polk. So when they get right to here, your freeway's kind of split and they're in the middle. So a plan was put together called the Gulf Coast Strategic <coughs> Highway. It turned out to be the Central Texas Corridor when they, they renamed it. But in 2015, I was going to say they need to use the microphone. <laughs> In 2015, is that better? Okay. In 2015, Congress approved this piece of the corridor right here, named it Interstate 14, and so the Central Texas Corridor or Strategic Gulf Coast Strategic Highway was born. Basically, Colleen needed to get west of Brady because Brady has a really busy downtown square with a whole bunch of dirt trucks and stuff. So they wanted to get west of Brady, and then catch the little highway up here. And then come across here. Let me see if I have the next one. Once the word kind of got out, they were getting to here. Other people got on board. Um, Goodfellow Air Force Base is here. But then all the oil fields in Midland, they wanted to be part of the package too. So the road has been, the project has been kind of extended up to here. This part has not been approved yet, but it's been extended. Now, by approved, all they, all they really said in Congress was that's a good idea. They didn't put any money towards it. That'll all be funded on the state level. But this was the this was the approved idea. So we want to know about that, but what really want to, what we want to know, I think, is how is it going to affect us here in Walker County and Huntsville. So this is the proposed route of I-14. When you talk to the I-14 people, they will tell you right up front, this is what they call a multi-generational project. It, it, it's not going to happen next week, it may not happen in a decade, maybe 30, 40 years for this project to come into being, but there are people out there that are lobbying for it and putting money behind it and pushing it to, to keep it going. So, but Huntsville is kind of far down the road, but um, but it is in the works. So basically it's clean and it follows existing highways. And initially it was designed to come to Bryan and then come across Highway 30 into Huntsville this way. But the right of way on Highway 30 and access through Huntsville turned to be a problem. So they're basically following the Highway 21 road from Bryan College Station to Madisonville. And then from Madisonville down I-4 to Huntsville, they would combine I-45 and I-14 at the same, do the same thing. So when I, when I talk about it, what I tell folks is once they get to Madisonville, they're in Huntsville. Okay, so, so to zoom in a little bit closer, this was the initial, the initial route, was Madisonville down I-45, and this is the part that concerned me, was the route they had here, and that was this route. And you read up in the top right-hand corner, that's very important up there, that's interstate standard. That means no crossings, no railroad crossings, no stoplights, it's overpasses and everything. So that's why I envisioned around the north side of town, and then those of you that have got off the off-ramp at the hitching post, this is what they've designed to go in that area. So that was even a bigger mess. So 
but I guess a couple of months ago, um, the mayor, the county judge, and myself we invited the two big the lead dogs of the I-14 coalition to come to Walker County, and we met with them and talked about that concern and gave them an idea. We said, what if you go down I-45 all the way to Highway 19, which is freeway, freeway, then Highway 19 is already four lanes back to the north, and then out 190. Out 190, we know we're going that way, just a matter of how they get there. So they said they would take a look at it, and then about two weeks later, I guess we made an impact, because this is what I got in the email, was they said they could see coming down I-45, this is Big E's crawfish right here. Anyway, to come down and just put one of the local pass all of a sudden and get them out Highway 190. What they haven't done on this is um, look at any specific pieces of property, haven't approached property owners, haven't talked about routing, haven't done any sort of studies. Right now it's just a line on a map. So um, anybody who lives in this area or might have a precinct in this area, I, I wouldn't worry about it yet. Uh, but, it, but this is something to, to think about. Now, remember, you know, east of Huntsville, the highway widening one project, 190 project, it's been on the books for quite a while. Um, this turning into a freeway through here and going east it does pretty good till it gets to Livingston because they have a huge lake they have to get over in Livingston to make that work. So that's why they talk about it being multi-generational. You know, sometimes it takes decades even just to get the property um, for, for a project like this. So that's pretty much, <coughs> this is where, where it is right, right now what's happening. Um, the momentum is, the two guys that are pushing this, Mr. Michelle and then the county judge from San Jacinto County. Oh, from San Jacinto County. Was it Polk County? Yes. Yeah. He, there are the two guys getting this up, and they are lobbying pretty hard. They have folks in Washington helping get things done. They're, they're working here in, in Texas with city managers, county judges, um, local businesses, Texas State and University. A lot of people are, are visiting with, the, with these two folks trying to keep this project moving forward. TxDOT is pretty supportive of it, and the legislature has established a couple funding methods. One is part of the sales tax and part of the vehicle registration. They haven't pulled that money aside yet. They have given them the opportunity once it gets going to start funding it that way. They have the new areas, like say the one from Brady up to the Midland area. And then there's a couple on the east side also down to Beaumont and then across, further, um, across Louisiana. They're expecting that to be approved in Congress because they're working pretty hard up there. And it, it will, it's gonna impact Orchard County. Like I say, it may be, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, but it's gonna get here eventually. So I put a little web location here. They've got a really nice website showing their processes and how, where they are and their progress. And they actually have one piece of this already in place from I-35 to Colleen up, up in that area. They already have an I-14 flag up there on the side of the freeway. So, so it's happening, um, it's moving pretty quick, but I think we're still quite a ways away from it getting here to Walker County, okay? So this is part two here. The bullet train. I know enough about this to be dangerous, okay? Um, it's, I, I did the research on it that I could, that I could take from news and their website, and so this is what I came up with here. It's gonna connect Dallas to Houston at 200 miles an hour, 90 minute travel time, 12 to $18 billion cost, all property finance right now. Now, there is discussion amongst folks who may not, who don't necessarily agree with the train, that the private financing is not gonna work at the end of the day. They're gonna to have to look for the state or the feds or somebody to come up with some money. Um, that part, that's, you know, I don't know anything about that. I just know right now they're saying, we're privately financed and we think we can make this happen. And the folks financing it are some pretty big, pretty big money. Um, the ex, um, ex owner of the Astros, is part of the group, and there's other folks that have that kind of money to make kind of stuff here happen. And they're investing in it, thinking that's gonna be good. It's got one stop between Dallas and, and Houston. Um, that's in Shiro, and we'll talk about that in a second. This is a design right now of the train. This is basically the Japanese version of the train, and that's who they've been contracting with or dealing with to design their train. Japan's had one running for a decade. Um, they've invested and done all the hard work to come up with one that they feel runs perfectly. So the folks here in Texas being privately funded, their, you know, their mindset is, what's the best thing I can get, the cheapest price, most dependable, 
The one in Japan has like an unblemished maintenance history record. An important part of the, of the construction is this right here. This train is gonna be going through um, cow pastures, backyards, neighbors, and stuff like that. And they're dealing with these property owners and they can't afford to have um, cut a guy's, you know, go, go to a guy's property and say, I need to come across your property. I'm gonna put this train at ground level and where you might have any time to have a train coming through here. So they're gonna elevate the majority of the train to keep it away from deer and cows and cars and railroad crossing kind of deals. Get it up in the air to make it a smooth trip. Just not have to worry about anything ever being in the way. And and the property owners having access to their property. Yes, sir. Excuse me, just a question. Um, uh, what is uh, roughly the base clearance from ground level to the base of that uh, railway? I, I don't know. Looking at that, 20 something feet would be my guess. It'll, I'm sure it'll be tall enough you know, a 13 foot, six inch tractor trailer, whatever the minimum highway clearance is for a bridge, I'm sure you'll be above that, but that part I don't know. This one's kind of hard to see, but I took it off their website. This is the general route. They're, they have a route that they want to run um, north to south, and that's the part that they're out surveying and trying to make work. Um, I'm sure it's fluid, it might change, but they just can't deal with this guy, but the neighbor says, hey, you can come over here. They might be able to make that work. The important part about this is this zone right here. It, everything kind of comes together here in the Shiro area. Um, Huntsville's that way, College Station's this way, along Highway 30. And that's important because AM is to the west and we're to the east from Shiro. Um, you can make it um, Dallas to College Station or Huntsville in, in 90 minutes. So theoretically, a person could live in Houston or in Dallas and commute to Texas A&M or San Houston State University by train, just get to Shiro and then, and then from Shiro to the university in a total of about 90 minutes. It's only 20 minutes from Shiro to downtown Houston, which is kind of important um, when you realize that now that folks can get to Houston by train from Shiro quicker, they, quicker than they can from Spring, Conroe, or even the Woodlands. So a person, a forward entrepreneur person might look at Shiro and say, hey, there's an opportunity for growth out there. They, if this train stops in Shiro, there's an opportunity there for houses and stuff like that, because it, it could be a big hub. The, the bullet train people did a, a statewide competition through universities and then had a contest, and this was the winning submittal for the Shiro station. It's, if you, and it's hard to read the little words, but it's, it's this energy efficient, recycle, groundwater cooling and heating, solar on the roof. It's an environmentally just friendly you can get kind of a building. It's pretty stylish looking. Um, and it would, a guy told me it would take up the whole block of Shiro. And um, <laughs> I agree with that. But if this happens in Shiro, Shiro's gonna turn into a little bit bigger place than it is now. Question? Yes, sir. Yes. Right now, it's right now it's in the Shiro area, is what they're saying. Just in the Shiro area. Okay, here's where we're at. As of last Thursday, um, land options for about 30% of the parcels have been obtained. And what they're doing on the options is they're going to a landowner and they're saying there's a possibility that we're going to come across your property. We need X feet wide and X feet long of a right of way if this was going to happen and they negotiate a price, $10 million, whatever it is. And they say, okay, you're, for you, for us to have you promise us to sell us that land when this happens, we're gonna give you this check today, a down, kind of a down payment deposit check. So they might give them, and I have no idea what that number is, I, I didn't ask them what they're getting, but they get a substantial amount of money, kind of as a deposit on that agreement. And if the train doesn't happen, and if this contract expires, they don't have to give that money back. It's a they just keep it. So it's a pretty good deal for the landowner, um, whether it happens or not. <coughs> they have, on the southern end in Water and Grimes County, they have 50% of the parcels for the proposed route. Now, in, I won't say it's in Grimes County, just last week, they had kind of a, I don't know, I guess the property owners are calling it kind of a, a win or I guess the, I guess the pushback against this, the, the, a judge in Grimes County 
told the survey people that they were breaking the law, survey in Grimes County because they were damaging the roads as they were surveying. So they had an order for them to stop surveying. But it turns out that the, the damage to the road they were driving was survey nails into the side of the road to survey off of. So um, it was, I guess, an angle to get them to quit working there, but it's one I think the, the railroad people think they're gonna work around. Okay, the third bullet. Um, initially, they made the first pass to the property owners and 30% of them said, sure, come on, we'll, we'll do the land, we'll do the deal with you. The others were like, I don't know or no, one of the two, but the railroad people of Texas Central still needed to survey the property to establish a route. So they went in kind of heavy handed and started getting court ordered survey access to this property based on an eminent domain um, authorization that railroads have. It, it was a very negative way to do business. Folks didn't like it. And so the railroad people had pulled that back and they withdrawn all their lawsuits to against all these property owners. So I think I, I like that idea better. I don't know if it's working any better or not, but um, that's, what, that's what they're doing with that. The, um, they're moving forward with it. The, the, the conference that I went to, a guy did a little one hour presentation on where they're at with it. They're full speed ahead. They truly believe that it's going to happen. Um, that they, they think they can work through all this stuff. And um, with that in mind, I thought I put the wrong button there. Okay, these are some legislation that were filed by our representatives. I know Mr. Schwartner's here, so I don't need to give the update on him. <laughs> anyway, researching on last Thursday, I didn't see any action on any of them um, as of last Thursday. So like um, Representative Coldhorst, she was looking to get like a anti-monopoly provision put in there, like the rail that was going in, she wanted it to be accessible to other types of rail. So let's say the Japanese train didn't work out or somebody else bought it and wanted to put a different kind of vehicle on it. Um, if their rail was, ten, was four and a half feet wide and our standard rail is three foot, 10 inches wide, it wouldn't fit. So she said, we need to have some kind of standard for the rail. I don't, that, that didn't make it out of, I don't think it's out yet. And then his other bills, um, the no other no other state funds. Um, this one right here. This was probably was a good idea, and I don't think it, it made it out. It was um, Senator Schwartner felt like it'd be good business if every property owner, as part of their agreement, got a bond from the railroad people saying we're going to start construction of your property, and let's just say it goes in the ditch and we're halfway through it and we go belly up then this, the property owner would have this bond that they could contract with somebody to come fix their property back up when they left. So like I said, I don't think that one made any progress. Um, and the eminent domain provision, I, I think they're kind of settling on the fact that the railroad, actually a judge in Houston deemed this to be a railroad and gave them eminent domain authority for their railroad tracks. Um, um, Senator Schwartner's bill was to ensure that any eminent domain land that was acquired as for this railroad would not be given to somebody else should the railroad fail. You know, in Texas, you can't do eminent domain for private development. I can't condemn property and put a Kroger there. But he was afraid that this company would get this property through eminent domain. Maybe the train doesn't work, and now there is a Kroger there. So I don't think that made it out of here. Then on the bottom, um, it's got some federal support. Um, President Trump has mentioned that he was he was pretty impressed with this kind of a project. So, so that's where we're that's where it's at right now. Oh, this is the other one right here. I knew I put that in there. Okay, on the eminent domain in Texas, we're very proud of our land. We hold on to it. We're not just going to give it up. But there is a railroad provision for transportation for eminent domain. So this is what the Texas Central people are kind of hanging their hat on. We're a railroad. We hope to get all this stuff the right way by dealing with the people, offering them money, they can do it a nice handshake and, and, and see them deal that way. But in our back pocket, they're going into it with a, but we always have the eminent domain card if we have to get to it. All right, so to kind of wrap it up, the good part is us to reduce the numbers of vehicles on I-45. Now. Another thing we in Texas love besides our land is our cars and our trucks, and it's hard to get us out of them. So they know that they need to make the ride on the train 
economically and timely or people aren't going to get into it. It has to be cheaper than a car trip, cheaper than a plane fare, and easier and more convenient than either one of those. So they know they have to get below that. It'll help the Shiro area, wherever the, whatever route they end up with out there, it'll help that. Um, it does open up a whole new group of students for A&M and San Houston State um, by opening up that corridor from Houston and Dallas to us. And of course, it's gonna create just gobs of jobs while they build it, okay? The bad part, people are asked to give up property, including by maybe by um, using eminent domain by the developers. Um, and I'm kind of I'm kind of on both sides of the fence with that. I mean, you hope it goes by the first vote of like, hey, I just keep offering you money until you take it, and then we can make this work. Um, if they get 90% of it and 10% are holding up the whole project, maybe it takes eminent domain. And you know, and honestly and truthfully, if you look back in time, you know, we we drive on freeways and highways that somebody gave the land up so we can drive on it. So it's a it's a forward thinking thing that. You know, you can kind of do what's good for your state or whatever, you know, if it's done the right way. So um, it is noisy for landowners. It runs every um, every 30 minutes, I believe. It runs every 30 minutes. And of course, it's going to have an environmental and an aesthetic impact. There's going to be a train track in the air um, by your property. And then finally, the unknown. Um, nobody really knows how much it's going to cost. It started off at $12 billion. And is up, last time I heard, it was closing in on $18 billion. And I think a lot of this is hinging on the cost of the land. Um, will they need state or federal funding? A lot of people seriously think they're going to. Um, they say they don't yet. And will it be used enough to stay profitable and stay in business? Um, you know, nobody knows that. You know, there's, they're putting a lot of faith in the fact that people want to get there quick and easy and, um, and that they think they can make money off of it. And I hope, you know, I hope if they think it's happened, I hope it works out positively for them. But that's my down and dirty really quick on the man, look at there. Yes. So if somebody commutes from Dallas or Houston to Shiro in order to go 30 minutes east or west to college, are they gonna have a car rental place there? Or are you supposed to have another car you leave there to drive back and forth? You know, I, I, I would almost think that if somebody saw that happening, but they would, that either the A&M would do like a Uber or, or San Houston have a shuttle. would do a shuttle back and forth to it. They could run back. I think A&M would jump on a shuttle right away. They're big bus over there. But and if that didn't take care of it and somebody thought they could make money off of it, I think they would put something over there for that. Back in the back first. Um, just a couple of questions. First off, uh, did I understand you correctly that roughly every 30 minutes, one of you see some ripple down the rail rate? That's correct, yes. Okay, and what is the uh, estimated or average decibel level of one of these things passing by? That I don't know. I know we have in various in municipalities for sure, and some out in the counties, they have the, I think it's an 85 decibel sound level rule that you have to be below. So it's going to be, it's electric. So all you're going to hear is you're going to hear the rattle, but it's supposed to be relatively quiet. It shot you. But I don't know the actual number to that. But it'll have to fall within certain parameters as far as sound. I grew up in the Baltimore, Washington area, and the, uh, the DC Metro runs on a pedestal system when it comes out of the underground. And uh, what they did to solve all these eminent domain problems is they used the existing interstate and put them right where the median is, that's where the stanchions go, and they run the, the, the rail above that. And that eliminates a lot of the cost it eliminates a lot of the noise problem because the train is actually quieter than the existing traffic that's on the highway. Right. And uh, the, there's, there's a an piece of this. DC metro area now that goes into southern Maryland and northern Virginia. Uh, and it's just normal business for them now. Yeah. You I mean, that's what you yeah. do. There's a piece, and it's not on this map, right up here in this northern. I think this piece right here has actually shifted over and it parallels on the newest map I saw it parallels I-45 so that may be someplace they've either looked at they, they don't they look at I-45 as being super congested with not a good median in the middle like they get ready to increasing four basically combine them all into one um, and our right of ways aren't really super duper wide but they're like I said I know they've looked up in the northern piece up here well, you put it right in the middle of the highway and, and lift it above the road so this, this is a fun one to watch. This one is definitely zooming forward. They've got money on the ground 
and um, ideas and landowners that are on board with it. And I, I was speaking with a lady last week and she was at a, I think it was a cow auction in Madisonville. And a lot of the old cowboys were, they were talking amongst themselves saying, yeah, I, you know, I signed it, my neighbor signed it. So it's, I don't have the up to date as to how many have signed it. This was as of, a, of I guess, middle of last week or so, but um, this one's moving along pretty quickly. Now there are a lot of detractors to it. A lot of you know, people, it's one of those nimby things, not in my backyard. It'd be nice to have a train, but I don't want to hear it. I don't want to see it. I want to go get on it in that magic land where nobody lives. But we don't have that in Texas anymore. And I do know there's um, some newspaper articles back there on the table that were brought it's back here in the back. Thank you very much. Um, to stop and read on there. So anyway, my point today, or my, my goal today, was just to put these on the chalkboard for you, let you look at them, and let them know that they're happening out there, and tell you what I knew about them. And um, yes? Where is it going to come into Houston and into Dallas? In Houston, my understanding is on the northwest side, not too far from the University of Houston campus. So somewhere in there, they're going to bring you in there and get you to the, north, to the Houston campus. I gotta save the shortener person for last. <laughs> Somebody, yes, ma'am. Well, my question is, uh, at least one question is, on the transportation, once you get to Dallas or once you get to Houston, uh, I mean, it's nice to get there in a timely manner, but if you don't have any transportation once you get there, or it's uh, awkward to get, or in time consuming to get, in case you didn't hear the question was what happens when you get there when you get to dallas and you step off the train or you get to houston and you step off the train you know then what um that'll be a new thing for us now in dallas they matter of factly say it's about a 10 minute walk to the to the public you know, public transportation in dallas and when you get to houston they're going to get you either to or very close to the metro system in dallas now it's a complete behavior change for us here in Texas. In Texas, we want to get our driveway and end up in a parking spot somewhere. We don't want to walk. So they're going to have to either, you know, change their culture a little bit and say, you know, you can get on the freeway and spend an hour in traffic, or you can get on, let's say, you hop on in Shire Road and you're in Houston in 20 minutes and you catch a 10 minute taxi ride for five bucks or however much it is and you're at work. So that's, that's, that's probably harder to me, it's probably going to be just as hard to do that as it is to say, hey, I need this 300-foot strip across your property that I'm going to write you a nice check for. Yes, ma'am. And they look at, um, you know, they have that megabus that goes back and forth. How are people using that? I know it was a big problem because when they got to a parking lot, there was, you know, there was no transportation. She asked about the, the mega bus truck, bus, the dummy, the, you know, bus rides for a dollar or something like that on the side, one up and down the freeway. I don't know what research they've done. I do know this, working in government for, since 1980, we wander off into stuff sometimes that we get about halfway through, we're like, wow, you know, maybe we should have tried a different direction and we back up and do it again. In the private world, you know, they've got, they're reaching in their wallets and putting money on the table. So my thoughts on this is that they're being very careful. You know, they, they've had to use some projections and some estimations, and somebody sat down and said, you know, if you can get X number of people today to ride this train, it'll, it'll pay for itself, it's viable, and let's go do it. So, I don't know, but they might just be crazy folks with a lot of money. I have no idea. But it being on the private side, it makes me think they're, they're looking pretty hard. Let me get her over here really quick. Yeah, I was just going to point out that there are, I believe, two bills, the 977 and 979, that are actually still on the move. Right. Using no, no state funds, they were passed out of the Senate, and they're both in the House. And so I think while the House versions might have died for about the next week or so, they can still bring up the Senate versions on the floor. Okay. I think it's 977 and 979, but you're correct, 978 just died. Okay. <laughs> so, Over here, yes? Am I keeping the money in American hands, or are they still yeah. using outsiders? They're going to use, right now they're using the, they're looking at the Japanese train. And, that, and to be honest, that's, a, that's as much of a sticking point as anything else for a lot of people. But once again, it goes back to, if, if I'm in a government, I'm gonna to try to shop at home, and, and, and generally it costs me more to shop here in the States. And then I gotta hope this company that I'm buying knows how to build electric trains, which we don't have very many of them that go 200 miles an hour, but we have zero. So they went to who has the best product right now and said, you know, we want to use your model. Now, maybe they get it and we, you know, we can copy it, modify it or something like that. But right now, it's, it's, they're strictly dealing with the Japanese folks. Yeah, but at first, it sounded like they were just using foreign money to build it with. 
No, there's a there's a big investor group, and there may be some foreign people in there. I have no idea. I just know that there's a lot of people that have a lot of money that are investing in this thing, and some of them are like some. Well, I, you know, I mentioned the Astro, and that's the, the name that sticks in my head was the uh, the Clayton guy, and um, I don't know the rest of them. But I'm sure that's a pretty good mix. You know, coming up with 16, 18 billion dollars is a pretty hefty. It take you more than a couple of weeks to do that. <laughs> okay, let me just have it back. Sorry. Thank you very much. One, one more question, yes. Uh, with the uh, interstate 14, mm -hmm. uh, how come there hasn't been more concern about eminent domain with that? And people, why are some places wrong? When it seems in the past, when you talk about eminent domain and roads, everybody was up in arms about it. <laughs> This one, by doing, by doing the way they're doing it here, following these these existing highways through here, like 21, if you've driven 21 from Bryant over to um, College Station, I mean, from Bryant to Madisonville, that little piece in there, um, or even Caldwell in that area through there, it's already, it's got a pretty wide right of way already, and it's, and it's double length. Yeah. And, and the Interstate 14, they have two standards. They have divided highway standard, and they have full freeway standard. In some places they know they won't be able to get full freeway, and so they're happy with two lanes each way, separated by a median. So there's not as much eminent domain. There's not as much on that one. And, and you know, when you start talking eminent domain, you know, back in the olden days, like when maybe when they built I-45, eminent domain was different. It's like, it was called a taking. We're gonna go take this land. We, we, you give it to us, no, I won't. Okay, we're just gonna take it. Nowadays, you say, will you give me this land? And they say, no, and you're like, now you have to get it surveyed, and you have to get it appraised, and you have value on it, and they appraise it for market value. So now you buy right away, even in a, even in a condemnation, at market value. Generally, especially up and down the traffic transportation areas, it's by the square foot. And it could be 50 cents a square foot, which is you know $20,000 an acre for pasture land. And if you have 2,000 miles of it you have to buy, that, that's a pretty big check. Yes, ma'am. You know, on the I-45 reconstruction, it's supposed to be two years. Is that going to be stopping at New Waverly or coming on tonight? Hello. <laughs> uh, the, what the deal is, uh, W.W. Weber is a contractor for Textile. They're starting there at the way station on northbound and southbound lanes to make it just like it is in Montgomery County, you know, because yeah. when you get to Walker, it's bottlenecks and people drive at 90 miles an hour. But it's a, right now, it's, they've been approved and they have the money to do it from the way station to all the way to the Trinity Crockett exit 19. And it's going to be a big, big, big change. They're going to do all kind of different, different things there. And they're going to, all the existing uh, exits and all the existing ramps that you can get uh, get on are going to be moved and uh, I mean, it's, this was a three-year project they've been looking at we saw all the all the uh, layout on it and got with all the EMS and the fire departments and DPS and everybody involved to make sure that we could get out of tech stop what we wanted it it, uh, it would probably the problem today is is that is that everything takes so long to do and they, they've got an estimate for a three-year project for that. That is, if we have good weather and everything goes right, you know, so uh, that, that's, that's where we're at today. Thank you. Kind of add on this, you talk about moving the, moving the off-ramps. On the interstate, you have two standards for an off-ramp. You have what's called a rural standard and an urban standard. The area down there has a rural standard, and it's basically to get you off, to get you on a crossing highway or, or a farm to So you get off at 150, you're at 150. Get off 1374, you're at 1374. The urban off ramp is they back you up, like you know, it's here in Huntsville. Now we back them up. You back them up a long ways, they can get off and they go across a bunch of developable property. Now they cross the, the feeder roads are on your before you get to the road you're going to. The feeder road crosses the property before you get to where you're going to. So they back them up away from the intersection, allows for cars to back up, but it's also a benefit to the community because it backs them up and they get off before all your retail stuff on the side of the road. So that's a that's a good change. Yes. I want to say your comments are very valid on all the concerns of, of people and I appreciate you keep referencing how when 45 came through or even now when you look at 75. Those homes never intended on it being a commercial street for so long. 
but having worked with college students as long as I have been in the last, last part of my life in my career, I'm amazed at what we think is normal, our generation, what we think is normal, like you've referenced several times. We, we Texans, we want our cars, we want, but there is definitely already such a cultural shift of they don't need their cars, they can Uber, they can have their friends, they go and they ride the trains, and it's a very um, eye-opening to is. deal with them. And so when you talk about things like this, it's closer than most of us, I think, and I'm not talking about a particular road, I'm saying right. the idea, um, it's much closer than a lot of people want to acknowledge because it is definitely a cultural shift, whether it's environmental, whether it's experience, whether it's Absolutely. personal, just whatever. And I think that was, that was um, very much showed up in her, and in in this was a, a young lady that designed this, I think it was a TSU, if I remember right. And that's what this is, exactly what you're saying. This is, let's, let's make a small environmental footprint, let's recycle this, it's solar, that, and that is a generation that's willing to get on a bus or a train True. and catch a little ride with maybe two or three other people to get someplace. All right, last question. Oh, sorry, well, it's more of a comment. We, we went to the presentation on this up on campus and Bill's done this presentation for various groups and it's interesting you talk about the different generations when they did when they did this presentation on campus all the you know the a lot of the college kids that were there were like wow this is great I can go to a you know a Astros game I can go to a you know, basketball game I can go to a concert you know the arts and all this other kind of stuff and then when you did a presentation at one of the retirement communities, they're like, oh, I can go to my doctor. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, That's so yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Really feel the same. Sure, sure. It's just, it's just looking at it. But yeah, they lit up when they're like, man, I can get to my doctor in 20 minutes. That, you know. And it feels in place. So we're anyway. We're sweating the, the work in New Waverly. We just have more training over around. Yeah. So. All right, folks, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time. Thank you very much.